wisdom did your leaders vote to murder this child? The need to bring human sacrifice to the tomb where it is more fitting to kill oxen? Or does Achilles wishing to kill his killers justly demand her death for his? But she did him no wrong. It is Helen he must demand for a tomb sacrifice. That woman destroyed him, brought him to Troy. So the title here is uh, a perennial text I've used as the Trojan War story. The saga of the Trojan War was so often resung, even by the time that Homer took up the story that he could rely on his audience knowing the myth. And so Homer concentrated only on two plots, the anger of Achilles and the return of Odysseus from the battlefield. He did not bother to fill in the background, merely assume that the myth was basic to understanding Greek culture, as we now consider it an essential root of all Western literature. All Greeks and Romans knew how Paris abducted Helen and that her husband Menelaus and his brother Agamemnon marshaled the army and launched a thousand ships to besiege the city for 10 years. Since it could not be broken by force, Odysseus invented the ruse of the wooden horse secretly loaded with Greek soldiers. The Trojans believed that the horse was a talisman that would make Troy invulnerable, but they were decimated by the stowaway Greeks. Beware of Greeks bearing gifts, as Virgil moralized the trick. Homer lived in the heroic age of Ionian aristocrats in the Eastern Aegean, and these tales enabled their conceptions of their 8th century BC selves, uh, ennobled their conceptions of their 8th century BC selves more than they revealed the Moor race of the Mycenaean age of the earlier 13th century when the Trojan War was thought to have taken place. A small war probably did, but not the monumental myth in inherited by Homer. There were giants in the earth in those days, to bring in Genesis for a moment. But the Ionian Age yielded to the era of the city-state, the polis, and the ascent of democratic values. 300 years after Homer, by the time of the Athenian tragedians, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, the story had been filtered through the epic cycle writers and others and was now viewed by city dwellers in a more critical manner. The hero's army is more tarnished and the heroic code scrutinized for new values. The subjects are no longer the anger of the hero or the patience and intellect of Odysseus, but dramas of contemporary life in the polis. Problems within the family, between family and state, problems in marriage, and consequences of war. These, con these concepts involved also fate and free will, morality, foreigners, identity, justice, and the role of women. The characters seek revenge, knowledge, and self-knowledge. These star-crossed human beings often, but not always, end in defeat, but not without being ennobled and ennobling us, the human race, through their suffering. The plays more often interrogate and complicate situations with emotions, ideas, actions, and poetic suggestion more than they resolve plots, as Homer did. But often they use the Trojan myths to transport their themes. Sometimes they sifted the values of the Homeric world, still trusting some, discarding others, but always willing to vary a traditional tale. Aeschylus revealed a world where justice, though delayed, existed. Sophocles showed the irony of pursuing Greek values, like knowledge that could be destructive. Our subject tonight, Euripides, demonstrated the triumphs of emotion, both good and evil, over reason. Like Homer, he tells only parts of the cycle of tales. 
But in these three tragedies, he sets two neglected aspects of the Trojan War center stage. The aftermath of the war itself and the actions and reactions of the living victims of the war and of war in general, the widowed women. The three plays I have translated spotlight female characters in the aftermath of the Trojan War. Each dramatizes a different tale. In the beginning of the Trojan Women, we find Hecuba, once queen of Troy, now lying on the ground before the tents of the triumphant Greek army. She rises slowly. She has lost all, husband, children, position, wealth, identity. No, not quite identity. She begins to admit, then accept the tragedy of Troy's fall. She recalls its glory. At moments, she relives its grandeur and she faces her new destiny, a slave far from Troy in Greece. Hecuba shows us how to live in hell. She begins by singing. Yes, singing in the original play, though the music, like most ancient Greek music, is lost. She sings to herself in order to rouse herself. Chasing Menelaus' hated wife, Castor's disgrace, the shame of Sparta, slaughterer of Priam, sower of fifty sons. She has run me. Poor Hecuba, aground in this disaster. What seats I sit on by Agamemnon's tent? An old woman and a slave. I'm led from home, my head pitifully mauled by grief. Oh. Poor wives of the bronze-speared Trojans and ill-mated brides. Troy smolders. Let's weep for it as if I were a mother of young birds. I'll raise the cry. Not the same dance song I raised for Troy's gods once when the scepter supported Priam and my foot was first in the dance with loud Phrygian steps. Later, the chorus laments the fate of the heroine by nostalgically recalling the glamour of the city <coughs> and most unhomerically blaming Zeus. Could you betray the temples in Ilium to the Achaeans so easily? And altars of sweet incense, O oh Zeus? And flame of honeyed offerings? The smoke of heavenly myrrh? Blessed Pergamon and Ida's, Ida's ravines of ivy reeds that run with rivers of the melted snow. The boundary struck first by the dawn, the sacred dwelling lit by sunlight. Gone are the sacrifices, the holy music of the choirs and all night vigils for the gods in darkness. The statues with their profiles of gold and festivals of the moon in Phrygia, that number 12. I worry, Lord, if you care for these things upon your heavenly throne. The burning of the ruined city, attacked by fire and blasted apart. Husband, dear husband. Dead, you wander about, unburied, unclean, while the sea ship, fluttering its wings, ravages me away to grazing Argos, where the people live within cyclopean walls, sky high. At the gates, a multitude of our children cling and cry and cry and cry. Mother, 
No, please no. The Achaeans pull me away alone without you. From your sight to their dark ship, with sea oars to sacred Salamis, or the Isthmian headland open two ways where Pelops' palace guards the Peloponnesus. Flashing with lightning, may Aegean's blessed fire, hurled with all might, strike amid ships Menelaus' oars in mid-sea, since he sends me away in tears, in tears from Troy. A slave from home to Hellas, while Helen, Zeus's daughter, <coughs> happens to hold golden mirrors the joy of girls. May he not come to the Laconian land, his fatherland and his hearth, nor the city of Pythone and its bronze-gated temple, capturing his cheating wife, great Greece's shame, that brought such miserable suffering to the river Samois. The second play, Helen, draws upon a legend not used by Homer, but by Stesichorus and Herodotus. That Helen never went to Troy at all, but a phantom sent in her place, and the whole ten-year war was fought over dream, as some wars have been. Hermes flew the real Helen to Egypt, where she lived until Menelaus found her after being shipwrecked on the homeward journey from the war. The story has a romantic flavor and a non-tragic ending. Aristotle said that tragedies do not need unhappy conclusions. Helen is pursued in Egypt by the king Theoclemenos, who wishes to marry her, but she must remain chaste in order to be returned to Sparta by her husband. At times the plot turns comic, as in this scene where Menelaus literally washes up in rags on the Egyptian shore and seeks help, not knowing his Trojan Helen was but a spirit. Reduced from Homeric splendor, Menelaus approaches Theoclamenus' palace in order to find help and learns from an arrogant servant woman that a Helen from Sparta lives there. The style has turned more conversational. Hello, some gatekeeper come out and take in a troubled message. Who's there? Won't you go off and not stand at the court gates making a row for my master? Or being Greek, you'll be killed. Greeks have no business here. Woman, you could say it better. I'll obey. Just give me a word. Go away. This is my job, stranger. That no one comes near the house. Wait! Don't touch or shove me. You don't do what I say, it's your fault. Announce to your master I that... I say announcing your words would go badly. I'm a shipwrecked sailor. A sacred group. Go to some other house, not this. No, I'm going in. Do as I say. See? You're trouble and you'll be tossed out. What? What's happened to my great campaigns? Yes, yes, you were famous wherever, but not here. Oh, Lord, how I'm dishonored. Why do you wet your eyes? What makes you so pitiable? For my former happy fortune. Oh, why don't you give your tears to your friends? What country is this? What barbarian home? This is Proteus' house. The land of Egypt. Egypt? Poor me. Where have I sailed? What's wrong with the glorious Nile? I don't blame that. I will lament my fate. Many fare badly, not you alone. Is your ruler at home? This is his <laughs> monument. His son rules the land. Where is he? Out or in the house? Not here. He's most hostile to Greeks. What did I do to deserve that? Helen's in the house. Zeus's daughter. What? What are you saying? Tell me again. Tyndarius' daughter, who was at Sparta. Where did she come from? 
What do you mean? She came here from Lack of Diamond. When? I have been robbed of my wife from the cave. Oh, stranger, it was before the Achaeans went to Troy. But get from the house, things have changed here. The royal house is troubled. You come at a bad time. If the king captures you, hospitality for you will be death. You know, I like Greeks, even if I speak harshly. But I fear my master. What am I to think? What to say? I hear bad news on top of all. If, since fighting at Troy, I come taking my wife, who was kept in a cave, and some other woman, having the same name, lives in this house, she said she was Zeus's child. Some other man has Zeus's name by the Nile. <laughs> There's only one in heaven. Where on earth is Sparta, but where Eurotus's streams and beautiful reeds are? Pindarius is the name of one man. Another land has the same name, like a diamond. Another Troy, too? I don't know what to say. In the wide world, many men have the same name, it seems. So do cities. And women. It's not amazing at all. <laughs> but the Helen also contains violence that seriously threatens the characters. Besides the real threat to Helen's chastity, is the guilt that Helen suffers knowing that Greeks and Trojans are dying in her name. In the following chorus, Helen's Greek women recall the divine anger and violence and claim that Helen neglected to perform rites to the gods out of vanity. <coughs> is Helen partly at fault for her fate? But first we hear of the great mother, Sibylle, blended with Demeter, here called Deo, whose daughter Persephone was carried off to the underworld by Hades. The goddess then refuses to do her task of yearly renewing nature, and men and women suffer and they die. She's also called Ceres. You have her for breakfast. as Ceres. <laughs> The situation parallels Helen's plight of capture, potential rape, and her need for divine help. The choruses also promise a happy, if violent, end to the tragedy. Once Sibylle, the mountain mother of the gods, with driving feet rushed up the whole wooded ravines and racing rivers, resounding salty waves in longing for her captured daughter, whose name cannot be spoken. The thundering cymbals cast their roar and blared out when the goddess yoked her chariot to beasts to track her daughter, snatched from the circling choirs of virgins, as swift-footed as storms, Artemis with her bow and wild-eyed Athena with her spear and armor darted to save her. From the bright heavens, Zeus devised another fate. When Sibylle had stopped her wandering days, her driving grief, seeking her daughter's insane and treacherous ravisher, she reached the peaks of Ida that nourished snow, a tower for nymphs, and flung herself in sorrow to snow-deep rocks and trees. For men the plains withered. She made fruitless the fields and blighted a generation. She gave the herds no fresh feed or leaves, Life left the cities. No sacrifices were offered. Offerings lay on the altars, unburnt. She stopped the tender springs from pouring out their bright white waters in grief for her daughter, taking vengeance. And she ended the feasting of God and mankind. Zeus, trying to calm the mother's Stygian hate, called out, Go down, O holy graces, go, and with your ecstatic rites, banish Deo's pain. Furious for her daughter, go to muses with your choral songs. For the first time, Aphrodite, most beautiful of the blessed, took up the quaking clash of bronze and drums with stretched hides. Sibley laughed, receiving into her hands the thunderous pipe, rejoicing in its roar. Neither right nor holy was what you burned, Helen, in caverns. 
You won the hate of the great mother, dishonoring her rights. No, her great power lies in dappled fawn skins, clothes and greenery, ivy that crowns the sacred thyrsus, whirling, shaking high in air of the bull roar's circling wood, hair streaming in the dance and wild for Bromius in Bacchic ritual, and night-long rites for the goddess, the moon surpassed her well in light. But you admired your own beauty. In the following scene, Helen and Menelaus, now united, plead for their lives before Theonoe, a prophetess and sister of the violent king of Egypt. Helen and Menelaus appear, appeal not just to the unjust king Theoclemenus, but to his and her just father, who sheltered and protected Helen when he was alive. Oh, virgin, I fall suppliant at your knees. I kneel in this unfortunate way for myself and this man, whom at long last I found. I'm about to see him die. Please don't report my husband to your brother. My beloved, just come into my arms. Save him, I pray you. Do not betray for, for your brother, your former holiness, by an evil and unjust gratitude. Gods hate violence. And they order everyone not to possess stolen property. Any unjust wealth is to go untouched. The sky is common to all men, and the earth, where they fill their houses with possessions and should not take from others or lose by force. Rescue me from torment, the pain I lie in. Add to my good fortune. There is no mortal who does not hate Helen. In Greece, they say I betrayed my husband and went to live in Phrygian luxury. If I went to Greece, set foot in Sparta, hearing, seeing themselves wrecked by the plans of the gods, and that I was not the betrayer of loved ones, they would give me back again my virtue, and I would give my daughter in marriage whom no one wants, leaving this bitter journey here. I shall enjoy the happiness of home. If this man were dead on the pyre, far away I would love him with tears. Shall I lose him alive now and saved? No, virgin, I beg of you, do me this favor and imitate the ways of your just father. This is the greatest fame for children. Whoever is born of a kind father turns out the same. These words are to be pitied, and you also. I want to hear Menelaus' words for his own life. In the Hecuba, <coughs> Euripides transforms the tale of the aftermath of the Trojan War once again. We return to the deposed queen of Troy, but she is not merely the survivor of slavery and humiliation, widowed of her husband and bereft of her children. The Hecuba is a revenge play, and the Mater Dolorosa becomes La Mer Sauvage. We face a Hecuba who fights the victors first with rhetoric and afterward with bloody retaliation. She taunts Odysseus for his disloyalty to her by persuading the Greeks to sacrifice Polyxena, her daughter, as a gift victim to Achilles' corpse. She claims Odysseus possesses an evil tongue and a vile heart, for she saved his life at Troy. The irony here is that she is now a slave to Odysseus, a slave that rebukes her master. The style rises again into the high tragic mode. 
Have you not turned bad for this edict? You who got from me what you say. You do nothing good for us, but all the evil you can. Yours is a thankless generation seeking a demagogue's honors. Be far from me. You who don't care about ruining your friends if you say something pleasing to the crowd. But with what wisdom did your leaders vote to murder this child? The need to bring human sacrifice to the tomb where it is more fitting to kill oxen? Or does Achilles wishing to kill his killers justly demand her death for his? But she did him no wrong. It is Helen he must demand for a tomb sacrifice. That woman destroyed him, brought him to Troy. If a captive must be picked out to die and be of superior beauty, that is not our lot. To Darius' daughter is the most extraordinary beauty, a doer of evil second to none of us. I challenge the justice of this case. But hear what you must pay me back. You say you touched my hand and this old cheek as a suppliant. I in return touch yours. So I demand this favor and I supplicate you. Don't tear my child from my hands. Don't kill her. Enough of killing. I rejoice in her and forget my troubles. She is my soul's image, making up for many things. My city, my nurse, my cane, my leader of the way. The powerful should not prevail when wrong, nor the lucky think they will do well always. I was lucky once, but I'm no longer. One day took all the prosperity from me. I beg you by your beard, feel for me. Go counsel the Achaean army that killing women is wrong. Women you didn't kill at first, but took from altars in pity. Your law about bloodletting is the same for free men and for slaves. Your honor will persuade them, even if you speak poorly. The speech of dishonorable men and honorable men does not have equal force. Later in the play, <coughs> Hecuba shifts from oratory to revenge by evening the score against the king of Thrace, Polymnaster, who killed her son, Polydorus, for his gold. With the aid of her court women, she kills Polymnaster's two sons and blinds their father. A very Greek avenger, for there is no point in killing your enemy who shall then cease to suffer. Like all murders in Greek tragedy, a violence occurs off stage, either because of the religious nature of the origins of Greek drama or because of the desire to stimulate the imaginations of the audience, like an old radio play. In this scene, Polymnaster returns to the stage as the traditional messenger in Greek tragedy, who reveals what has transpired behind the doors of the Skene. The messenger, however, is usually a more objective voice, someone not directly involved in the action. Here, Polymnaster, blind and bleeding, pathetically tells his horrific tale, crawling on all fours like a beast. He vainly attempts to cover up his greed with a defense, claiming he killed Polydorus to help the Greeks against the Trojans. For Polydorus, if he had lived, would have mustered an army to avenge fallen Troy. His greed shines through his faulty claim. He berates Hecuba before Agamemnon, bellowing 
for justice. There was Apollodorus, the youngest son of Priam and Hecuba, whom his father Priam gave me to raise in my house, surely suspecting Troy's fall. I killed him. Why did I kill him? Listen, how it was, wise foresight. I was afraid the child would remain your enemy. Regather the Trojans and reunite the city. The Achaeans, knowing a son of Priam alive, would raise an army against Troy, then ravage and plunder my Thracian plains. Troy's neighbor would fare badly, right where we suffer now, my lord. Hecuba, knowing the deadly fate of her son, led me on with the story that she would tell me of chests of Priam's gold in Troy. She brought me alone into the tent with my children, so no one would know what she did. I sat in the middle of a couch, knees bent. Many Trojan women sat on both sides of me, as if I were a friend, and examined my robe in the light and praised the Edonian weaving. Others, seeing my two Thracian spears, stripped me naked, both of arms and clothes. All the mothers, marveling at the children, rocked them in their arms away from their father, passing them on. After what seemed a calm greeting, suddenly some took swords, some were out of their robes, and stabbed my children, others taking enemy revenge held down my hands and legs, wanting to help my children if I raised my face. They held down my hair if I moved my hands. Wretched me could do nothing in the mob of women. At last, an outrage beyond outrage. They committed an atrocity, taking the brooches they stabbed, gutted my poor eyes. Then they fled throughout the tent and I attacked them like a beast who harassed murdering dog, searching every hole like a hunter, hurtling, thrashing. I did you this favor and suffered because I killed your enemy, Agamemnon. To be brief, if anyone spoke badly of women before or speaks now or will speak, I shall sum up their speech. Neither earth nor ocean nourishes such a race, so everyone knows who has met one. After such a misogynistic note, Agamemnon must judge between Hecuba and Polynestor. Even from this elliptical reading of these three plays, we can see that Euripides presents philosophical ideas and arouses the deepest emotions. Perhaps for that reason, Aristotle called him the most tragic of poets. At the end of the play, as at the end of all Greek plays, the emotion must be purged. In Milton's words, tragedy ends with calm of mind, all passion spent. Later, Agamemnon announces that naturally and symbolically, the skies have cleared, the winds are favorable, and the Achaean ships can weigh anchor for Greece. Hecuba had a chance to be freed from slavery, but she chose revenge. Polymnesta viciously predicts Hecuba's imminent death. She boldly answers, no matter, since you paid me back. For Hecuba, revenge transcends death and transcends life. Euripides asks the ancient and the modern audience, can you blame her? Thank you. Most of these are not a trilogy. No, they're not a trilogy. Um, Euripides was writing pretty late, and the idea of trilogies had almost passed. Actually, the Trojan Women is part of a trilogy, but we don't. We only have parts of the other two plays. Do you know so, the names of them? Uh, yeah, one is the uh, uh, Andros is one of them. Uh, and the other one is the, uh, think of, we can find it at the beginning of my book, but okay. the, uh, the, 
the person who invented writing, I forget now what, that, what the name of that is, but we only have fragments. And, uh, but we have enough to piece together what was, what was happening. But no, the other two plays, uh, they were looked upon by that time as old-fashioned. You know, uh, Aeschylus did that. Sometimes there were trilogies, but the plays are not united trilogies. They just had three plays. In the beginning, they had three plays that actually related to each other in terms of theme and in terms of uh, time. Mm -hmm. Trojan women. Um, but I teach it to my students. I, I suggest to them that one of the, uh, the cruelties of the play is that uh, it has forced women, uh, by breaking down the walls of their city, to become heroes and act like men. And that this is cruel. What do you think of that? Well, of course, it's looked upon by a lot of people that uh, the women uh, end up being the heroes. Uh, they're the ones who live, they're the ones who have to endure. But heroism is no longer just conquering on the battlefield. Heroism has to do with uh, sustaining oneself uh, from a good Greek idea of, of facing up to a terrible fate. As I said, what do you, what do you sing in hell? What do you do in hell? And, uh, so she doesn't become discouraged. Uh, when Andromache in the play becomes discouraged, Andromache uh, wants to commit suicide, and she talks Andromache out of committing suicide. She, you should not commit suicide, uh, which is more of a Roman answer than a Greek answer. But uh, so in the beginning, I think that Euripides is saying there's another kind of heroism, a heroism of endurance, a heroism of not losing your identity and of fighting in spite of circumstances, can you take it? And uh, the women show the power that they have in being able to endure and to go on. So for Hecuba in the long run, uh, she says, you know, better the life of a slave than no life at all. That's a fair distance from the heroism of the battlefield to the heroism of bearing what needs to be born in order to live. How, does, how did that passage occur historically? Well, of course, 300 years have passed, and the idea of the uh, society has gone through all sorts of other changes. No longer is the image that uh, the hero, like the medieval knight on the horse, represents, the, uh, represents society. So in the Homeric world of the, uh, of the eighth century, the, uh, they obviously would not live up to what happened in medieval romance or what happens in the Trojan War, but they were looked upon as heroes. They had special privileges, that uh, uh, not being faithful to their wives and all sorts of other things. They get honors because they do things to help society. But with the level, leveling that comes across with the rise of democracy later on in Athens, you no longer get that anymore. So the idea now is, well, we're no longer trying, there's still war, there's still mostly war, but we're still not thinking in terms of the heroes are gonna be the people that we're gonna cultivate, the people we're going to uh, live up to. Uh, and maybe because people like uh, Euripides came along and said, well, there's other ways of looking at this, and you know, well, who's the real, who are the real heroes? And the men are dead, and you know, who carries on life? I mean, you know, that the, the women are gonna carry on, uh, carry on life. So uh, maybe hero, you look at the, the heroes in Greek plays, I mean, you, you get uh, people like Antigone and people who just uh, say, well, the, the family is more important than the law and, and humanity is more important than uh, the king. So you get a different set of values, maybe because you had those other values. Sometimes they, uh, they come to the fore, but they tended to avoid it, even when Aeschylus came up with the Persians. He told from Persian point of view, there was a riot in the theater. I mean, you know, a lot of these people had lost their sons in the war. And yet the, they went on to look at it from, from a more objective uh, and a broader point of view. So we see the same thing. Uh, heroes change in American culture, and uh, you no longer have uh, the great heroes of uh, the 19th century America folklore. Uh, you know, no longer have just cowboys. Uh, you know, things change. 
And uh, so heroes are no longer necessarily, except in a narrower populace than Superman. So, uh, that's what I think uh, occurred. And part of it was you already had it, and part of it is that uh, what's going to appeal to, to an audience today is much more of, of a sense of equality. In a sense of equality, they get rid of the kings, for example, no more kings. That, so all of a sudden, you have a sense, well, well, one person is not greater than all these other people. You know, that's kind of a myth. Uh, you know, that the idea of the single hero who can go out and win almost a whole war on the battlefield by himself, the Hercules figure, is no longer so believable anymore. And I think that that's, he, loses, uh, he loses credibility once you get out with the spread of the idea of equality. Yeah, one man's a little stronger than another. But no man is so good that he should be an absolute rule and everybody else should follow what that person does. We just don't believe in that. We, we tend to believe in collective wisdom. We tend to believe in collective power. Better to have a group doing things than it is to believe that one individual is going to uh, do things. And also there's the decline in the belief in the gods that no longer uh, uh, the audience for Euripides' plays. But peop some people were very conservative. They still believed in the old Homeric gods the way Homer did. Other people were doubters. Uh, one of his best friends was Socrates, who questioned everything. Uh, and in one point in the Trojan Women, uh, Hecuba uh, prays to Zeus, and then she says, if you exist. Do you exist? Are you just air? Are you just the mind of man? Are you real? And then she says, but sometimes when we cry out, we have to cry out to somebody. So, so that analyzes what's going on here, and there is then a, a shift from a, a theological world to a more realistic, realistic world. What motivated you to do these translations, and what did you bring to it that the earlier translations had not? Is it more accessibility or closer to the, the musicality of the language? I mean, and what challenges you had? In, uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, what I did was I worked with a theater company for several months, and uh, they uh, put on uh, my uh, Trojan Women, and they put on my Bacchae. And so what I learned from there, and I developed the translations. For example, the theater company asked me, well, what should they use for translation of Trojan Women? I said, well, I I don't think there is a good translation of Trojan women. I think part of the problems was there are good translations in the past, there are great translations in the past if we go back to uh, uh, Lattimore and Green and people like this. But the idiom has changed, poetry has changed, people have changed. Uh, so, and many of the other plays are either done by scholars who were not very good poets. And uh, so, this was, you know, they, they used to say of David Green that he was really, you know, a, a great Greek scholar. He just know the English language very well, you know. And, uh, and so what happened there was I, I could sort of, and there were poets who were doing translations, but they didn't know the original Greek. So I thought maybe I could find a way of doing this that I could get back to the original language and at the same time I had published hundreds of poems and, you know, so maybe I could also create that connection between uh, the poet and, uh, and right now there's so many new translations coming out. It's very uh, competitive, uh, which is good. But I think the difficulty is, my rule was, can an actor say it to an audience and can they immediately understand it? Does it have some sort of power to it? Uh, can it reflect back on the origin, original language, these things? So I figured if an actor can say it, can get it across to an audience, then a reader should be able to read it and understand it. So that was, so I don't want a lot of footnotes. I don't, you know, the footnotes are in the back. You want to look them up. I got to put them in. They wouldn't get published without doing footnotes. <laughs> I wouldn't be called a scholar unless they went footnotes. Uh, so, uh, but can you just pick it up from the, uh, from the text? Now I have to cue you and say, well, do you know the story of Trojan War? <laughs> you know, in other words, you have to have some of the background that an ancient Greek had when he went, uh, uh, she went, because they did go when, 
uh, and watch the plays. But uh, so those were my criteria. And I thought a lot of people uh, weren't doing that, that they were either making it too modern. Uh, one translator, she said, well, uh, I'm not going to write the word pregnant because in my neighborhood they say knocked up. They said, well, if I said knocked up in a Greek tragedy, people are going, what? You know, it, 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 because that isn't what people expect. You see, you have certain expectations. <laughs> also, ancient Greeks simply had a higher idea of being a human being than contemporary world does. And for that reason, I think there is a kind of uh, somewhat elevated. Now, I can't go very elevated. This is 21st century. Uh, everybody's going to say, oh, no, we, you know, this is, this is just translator ease, and I can't do that, and, you know. So to hit a note between can it be expressed, uh, immediately effective, uh, and at the same time get the feel that uh, it's poetry without the audience saying, oh, he's writing poetry. <laughs> so I don't, I don't want that. So I tried to make the line flexible. Generally, in the uh, speeches, there's a four-beat line, four-stress beat line. Uh, but it's flexible. Sometimes I go to five beats, sometimes I go to three beats. If something's going to go, I've got to go for what is more understandable than what is more mathematical. Uh, so therefore, I have to really, in the odes, I have to reflect the same meter in the strophe as in the antistrophe, the first two parts of the, uh, the ode. So I have to work on that. That's sometimes the hardest part because, again, it has to be something somebody can understand. That it's, someone's not saying that, well, as they say about bad poems, you're just stuffing owls. Well, I don't want to just stuff owls. You know, that, so that's basically what I tried to do. So that's why it's good because I watched audiences for uh, and actors for months do these things, or I watch people who are listening and see how many people are asleep, how many people are still awake, uh, and to try to see, what, or, and students, I've tried them out, you know, can they understand what's going on there. Not just understand, but feel the sort of power that there is in the original. I have to put it into English poetry. I cannot you know, put it into Greek meter. Some people take the same meters and try to make them work in English. Same meters are in English, but they don't work the same way. Uh, for example, you have dactylic meter, uh, but it's completely, it's used, dactylic and anapestic are used for uh, comic verse in English. And you hear, hear it, you're going to think of comic verse, you know, towards the night before Christmas and all through the house. It has a galloping little thing and that's not, going to, uh, that's not going to work. So uh, I have to think of what's going to be effective for the audience. The other thing is, can I keep parts of the Greek language? For example, you notice that here they're very long speeches, sometimes 25 lines. Well, in ancient Greek, that's all one sentence. Now, in English, you're just not used to doing that. You can't do that. So while I try to suggest it, I've got to break it into units that you can, uh, that the audience will understand. So there's a lot of questions like that. And diction is, you know, is just another thing. So what words can I use? What words can I not use? Uh, I cannot repeat a word that the Greeks necessarily repeat, although I try to, to do that. I can do, I'll do it as long as it works. But when it doesn't work in English anymore, I have to be resourceful. So how did you handle the poetry of the chorus? The poetry of the chorus, uh, I had to find uh, flexible ways of doing it. Obviously, when we switch, you notice it here. You go into the chorus. It's a di different kind of uh, poetry. That's how Greek tragedy makes its ships. Uh, there's a kind of poetry that goes to the dialogue. When it ships to the ode, there's another kind of poetry, higher, sometimes mythological gives distances on the action. Like the, uh, I read you the thing where we're not talking about Helen anymore. Now we're going to talk about Sibylle and what happened to her and her daughter and the loss of the daughter. That's typical of what a chorus does. It, it says, well, I'm going to take a different myth. I'm going to show you something else about this or this from another angle. 
So that's exactly what they try to do. So therefore, uh, your poetry, you'll accept it being sung, can again go up a little bit uh, in, uh, in intensity from ordinary dialogue, or it can be made, uh, can be made more poetic in the sense that now I have to echo the lines exactly from one part to the, uh, to the other part. So I think that's fun to try to do, but it can be, take you longer than anything else. <laughs> it can be very frustrating, but it can be re re rewarding when it, uh, when it works out. So there's a different kind of meter. I have to match the lines meter to meter. There are hundreds of Greek meters, and there are all sorts of meters uh, that are used for the choral odes. The dialogue is, is the same as it is in English, it's iambic. So what you're used to in Shakespeare's plays, what you get used to in Euripides, or what you get used to in, in Aeschylus or Sophocles. So that is transferable. But again, you can't be Procrustean. I can't, uh, I can't necessarily fit the line to the ten syllables of iambic pentameter. I'm going to chop it, or I'm going <laughs> to pad it, I'm going to do something that's not going to be right. So I need a flexible line. So four beat stress syllables in the way to uh, the way to do it. Mm -hmm. So I don't want you to be conscious of the poetry. I don't, I don't, you'll notice that when Daphne read it, she didn't go clunking along with the uh, with the meter. The meter's underneath it. Uh, what you do is you express what you have to express. It's up to me to make sure that the eternal element, the mathematical element, is working underneath the surface. Uh, are any of the plays going to be uh, enacted sometime soon? Well, I had, the Trudge Women has been enacted several times. Uh, Where? Uh, in Boston at the uh, Calderwood Pavilion at, uh, in Boston. It was, uh, and it was enacted in uh, Athens State University in, in Alabama. And uh, so they have been, yeah, that has been. Uh, now that I've got it into print, I'll look around for more people to uh, do them. And I have not seen the Hecuba or the Helen acted out. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had people take parts and practice, but I have not had any professional production. Of it. it was a, a movement from the heroic to the more democratic. Did it ever reach a... Uh, um, a point where you had a Don Quixote-like figure, or um. you do get some of it because, of course, in the comedies you do get satires about the blustering hero or or things like this. Don Quixote is somewhat complicated because, I mean, he's a great hero. If the world were the way Don Quixote wanted it, it would be a wonderful world. It just isn't that way, and so he's a, a heroic figure trying to be heroic in a world that is not heroic. And so he comes off as ridiculous. So that's very typical of a Spanish, the double world view. Uh, Spanish sometimes dominated so long by different other cultures. They think that's where it comes from. But uh, there is the idea that there's one view of the hero and then there's one view of the world. And they clash. And they clash humorously in Don Quixote and also cruelly in Don Quixote. So. Uh, Don Quixote stops the man from beating his child. He says, you know, well, you've got to stop this. I make you swear that you'll never beat this child again. And he says, oh, yes. But by the time he's ridden down the hill, he's already beating the child again. So, I mean, this, this is the real world. If Don Quixote was right, he could do that. That would be wonderful. But he can't. Only in storybooks. And he's, his head has been turned by storybooks. So, uh, yeah, there's a difference. Uh, as I said, Menelaus turns up in this play. He's no longer the hero in the Iliad that he is, or even the, in the Odyssey. And there he's not the greatest hero. He's the world's greatest cuckold, is what uh, he is. But he now comes out in rags. He's, uh, he's wrapped himself. He's lost all his clothes. He stitched some clothes together from the sails out of the shipwreck. And now he comes out on stage and, and the Aristophanes and other people made fun of this. They said, aren't you really taking down the great figures in the, in the heroic world that now they're appearing on the stage in rags? And they look ridiculous as in that scene that we did about going up knocking on the door. And here he is, you know, what happened to all my great campaigns? You know, and the audience's answer was, yeah, you were famous somewhere, but you know, 
forget it now. I mean, it's no, it's no longer going to work uh, in the real world. So very often drama takes the path, as a novel does, I'm going to get more realistic, more realistic, more realistic. And in one way it doesn't, but in another way it looks that way. So. Uh, and one way to be more realistic is to say I'm going to change, I'm going to change the past. So, any questions? Thank you. Orpheus went down to the underworld to retrieve his young bride, Eurydice, because he felt that she'd been taken too young, and he couldn't stand to have her gone but was told there was a rule he could not look back on the, on the walk up. And once he did, she was lost to him forever.